In the book of Romans, God, like a master architect, lays out his incredible plan of salvation. Using the apostle Paul, God sketches out the blueprint of the good news of Jesus Christ for all mankind. The same news that turned Paul from a murderous persecutor of Christians into a fervent follower of Christ himself. With great passion, Paul uses the themes righteousness, condemnation, justification, salvation, sanctification, glorification, sovereignty, and transformation among others to unpack the details of a simple yet incredible gift, the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel message found in this letter has changed millions of lives since it was written thousands of years ago, and its timeless truth has made enemies of God into friends of God, and dead people into resurrected people. It will no doubt point you as well to the source of salvation, Jesus, Savior and Lord, the cornerstone of God's perfect blueprint. Well, good morning, Journey family. Uh, my name is Stephen Mulkey, and we are in the Book of Romans. We're going through a whole sermon series through the Book of Romans, and uh, we just have two sermons left. We got this sermon in the first half of Romans 16, and then uh, one more sermon in the second half of Romans 16, and it's going to be just a blowout in these last two sermons. I'm so excited uh, to be digging into the Word today. So get your Bibles out, turn to Romans chapter 16. And we're going to dive right in. Uh, The title of today's sermon is Personal Ministry. Personal Ministry. And Paul is going to go through an entire list of all of these people that he ministers to and ministers with. And and we're going to show really clearly, Paul is going to show really clearly, just how ministry is is personal. It's practical. It's based in community. Uh, Relationships are everything. I've talked about that before in one of my Mentors Tim Wimberly said over and over and over again, still says it, he's a missionary in Romania with his wife, and Tim has said over and over again to me, relationships are everything. Relationships, you know, not, it's, not, it's not about the, the wealth we have, the things we have, it's about relationships, because those last into eternity. So, uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is The Godfather, and in, in The Godfather, there's a character named Michael Corleone. And the Godfather, if you've never seen it, it is rated R. It's not, I mean, it, it's, it's a mature film, it's a tragedy, uh, but it's just, it, it's an epic story, and it's so well told, and um, in it, Michael Corleone, one of the main characters, says, it's not personal, it's business. It's not personal, it's business, and when we look at the church, the church is always personal, and some of the biggest problems that happen within the church happen because people begin to treat the church like a business rather than like a family. They begin to treat the church like a business, like, and the people in the church like their math equations to be solved. I've seen it over and over again where people have the right theology, people have great leadership skills, and they begin to think that if they just put the right theology and the right leadership skills together, then they can make, make a successful church, not realizing that a successful church is not just how many people are in the church, but it's the disciples being made and the people being reached in the community. Church is personal. Ministry is personal. People are not math equations. People need to be loved. So let's dive into the text today, Romans chapter 16. And we're going to do a bunch of names. I'm going to do my very best with these names. Uh, You can laugh or you can do your best with me. Here we go. Uh, Verse 1, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sencre, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well, meaning a patron in time, treasure, and talent to enable Paul's ministry to succeed. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my fellow, uh, greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first convert to Christ in Asia. And make a note of all the language Paul uses here. It's not, uh, you know, this person who did this or did this. It's my beloved. It's, it's, it's how much we care. It's how much we 
love all these people who minister, not just what they do, but who they are. Uh, greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet and Politus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, my beloved Stachus. Greet Apellus, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsmen, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Trophinia and Trophosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. That incredible that Paul's saying this, this man's mom has also been a mother to him as well. Greet uh, Asyncretus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philogius, uh, Julia, Nerus, and his sister in Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet everybody. Make sure everyone gets an individual greeting from me. Verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Now, that verse 16, obviously during a pandemic, we're not greeting one another with a holy kiss, but in that culture, in that day, uh, greeting one another uh, on the kiss on, with, with a kiss on the cheek would have been uh, a sign of, of relationship and intimacy that, that I'm with you and we're together. And uh, so that's something that, um, that in that culture, in that day, and there's still cultures today that, that have this. Now, I know in America, we don't usually greet one another with a holy kiss. I would greet my wife with a kiss, but I'm not necessarily going to greet other people. And that's very much a cultural thing. But what Paul's emphasizing is uh, not only the need for physical interaction to show love, but this sense of everyone needs to be pointed out and cared for and loved and knowing people's names matters. It's super important that we know people's names. I don't know about you, but I see a distinct difference. I respond differently when people know my name and people respond back to me differently when I read their name tag and I just respond, thank you. Thank you for making me coffee, Samantha. Thank you for making me coffee, Nathan. I mean, you're using somebody's name at Target, at Starbucks, wherever you're at. It makes a big difference because people want to be recognized. You, you can't over-recognize somebody. No one's going to end their day saying, man, I just got over-encouraged and recognized. You've heard me say that before. I just need to say it again because I think we forget because there's so much negativity all around us, but people want to be encouraged. And I love that Paul encourages here, and he's showing how ministry is personal. So that's point number one. Ministry is personal. It's not, uh, it's not personal. It's business. Wrong. Ministry is always personal. It's about people. It's not, it's not about, you know, God has called me to preach, teach, and develop leaders and to plant a thousand churches. Now, that, that may come across like, I guess it's just data. I guess Pastor Stephen, because he's got to plant a thousand churches, uh, doesn't care about the, the individuals. No, I recognize God gave me a huge number, and I'm going to work the rest of my life to see a thousand churches planted. It probably won't even be done in my lifetime, but those churches are planted by individuals. And all of my gifting is done to preach to people, to lead people, to develop people into leaders. Ministry is always, always personal. Paul lived his life opening, um, he, he opened up his whole life to these people and he knew them by name. They knew him and loved him. There was a sense of reciprocity here that Paul was saying, let's support one another, let's love one another, let's care for one another, using people's names. Ministry is never a solo endeavor, it always involves people. The one another's of the Bible mean that we need each other. And so here's, here's how I want to present this. Um, is, is this, is who's your mentor? So who in your life, because ministry is personal, who's your mentor? Who's side by side with you? And then who's your protege? So who's your mentor? Who's side by side with you? And then who's your protege? Think about this for a second, because ministry, what we're doing in our homes, in our community, in our church, is incredibly personal. And so who is your mentor? Well, uh, I've had a few mentors in my life. Uh, my uncle Chris is an absolute mentor in my life. My dad is a mentor in my life. There are, there are two things um, that I think about every single day. One of them is from my dad. My dad said, son, early's on time. On time is late. 
and late is unacceptable. And I just grew up knowing that if I'm going to be somewhere, I need to be there early because early is on time. On time is late and late is unacceptable. And it has served me well. That's my dad, Sam Mulkey. Now, my uncle Chris, on the other hand, uh, and uncles have the freedom to do things a little bit differently. I remember um, being with uncle Chris, helping my aunt move, helping the community move. Uh, just, I just remember a lot of moving when I was around Uncle Chris. We, he would get a truck and moving van, and we'd be helping people and serving people. I remember one time I was sitting in Uncle Chris's, I was sitting in the moving truck with my cousin John, that's um, Chris's son, and then uh, Uncle Chris was there, and I, was, I think I was in the middle, and, and John was to my right, and Uncle Chris is here. It's like one of those big moving trucks. And I remember Uncle Chris saying, uh, Stephen, when do you go to the bathroom? Do you crumple or do you fold? And I remember I was 11 and I panicked. Like, oh my gosh, what, uh, uh, you know, I like hesitated because it's like, I don't, know, I don't know what the right answer is. You know, and he was like, you always fold. Crumpling is just going to make a mess. You always fold. And I was like, done. I mean, he mentored me not only in saying, always fold, never crumple, uh, but in so many other things, Uncle Chris has mentored me and has been uh, someone that I look up to Um, in my life, and I'm so grateful for him. And uh, he recently gave me something, and I carry it with me now uh, wherever I'm I'm at. It's actually a challenge coin, and it has uh, put on the full armor of God, pray always, Ephesians 6, 11 through 18. And so on the the front of this coin, it's put on the full armor of God. On the back, it has all the, the armors. I keep it with me just to remind me to put on the full armor of God. And he's been a mentor in my life. Other people have been a mentor. Dave Kraft. Dave Kraft was in the Navigators for uh, about 50 years, I think. And uh, Dave mentored me when I was at working at a church in the Seattle area. And I remember I could spend an hour or two with Dave, and my ministry would just skyrocket in effectiveness and in efficiency and in love for people because Dave just was wise and he loved me. Uh, there's another man named Ken Robertson. Ken Robertson, I met last year at the Heartland District Conference, and Ken is my coach. I talk to him once a month, sometimes multiple times a month, and he speaks into my life. He counsels me. He's my mentor. There's another man named Bert Smith. Bert Smith was uh, is, is a pastor within Foursquare, and he he gave me the phrase that you've heard me say so many times: "You are greater in the eyes of the Lord than you are in your own." That is something Bert hammered into me. Man, Pastor Bert, I'm so grateful for you and your wife. My life, my whole family's life shifted radically because of Pastor Bert and his wife, Jan. We had a moment in time where we were going to move to Illinois to go be on staff at a church in Illinois. And I remember I met with Bert and Jan, and Bert and Jan, they just sat me down. And Jan, uh, his wife, had this prophetic word where she said, God has, has a work that he's done in you, and it's, and, and it's not done yet here in Olympia. You need to stay. You need to be at this other church called Living Water. And she, she and Bert just had a prophetic sense where we needed to be, and we did. We stayed, and the rest is history where we joined Foursquare. We were a part of Living Water, and then uh, you know we came here to be the lead pastors at the Journey Church. And I'm so grateful to be the lead pastor here and that was all driven by uh, Pastor Bert and Jan. Now, the final one that I have, now there's more mentors, I just have these, is John Dirks. Now, John Dirks was the guy whose church I was going to go to in Illinois, and he has been a mentor to me ever since I was an intern. He's a pastor at Harvest Rockford in Illinois, and he's a great man of God, him and his wife, Betsy Dirks, and their whole family, and just love them and are so grateful for their influence in my life and my family's life. So who's your mentor? Who's mentoring you you need a mentor. You need, because ministry is personal, you need a mentor. Uh, now, mentors pour into you. The next one is who's side by side with you. I have people that are side by side with me. We are running the race. We are going at the same pace. We are, uh, we, we are saying together we are going to poke holes in the darkness. Together we're going to punch the devil in the face. Together by the spirit of God, by the power of God in our life, we are doing ministry together and alongside one another. And the first person I think of is my wife, Jessica, that we are doing ministry alongside one another. It is hard. I have to tell you, church, whenever we've started a new work, whenever we've come into something new, it's always been hard. When we planted a church in Olympia, Washington that first year, we're so 
tough, but we had one another. When we moved from uh, that church in Olympia to another church in Olympia, and we joined a whole new movement in Foursquare, that first year, incredibly hard. I was looking at my wife, Jessica, last night, and we looked at one another, and we just said, this year, coming here to Madison, joining the journey, becoming the lead pastor, going through a pandemic, transitioning people, loving in the midst of this. It's been one of the hardest years of our life. But you know what? We're doing it together. I got somebody side by side with me. I love you. My wife is incredible and I could never do what I do without her. Another person who's side by side with me is John Kobler. You've heard him preach before. He's a close friend. He's still in Olympia, but he's side by side with me and and encourages me and builds me up. PJ Moon is another man. He's a pastor down in uh, Austin, Texas. I'm actually going to go visit him, and uh, I'm so excited to see him and his wife and their son. And I've never met their son before. I'm so excited to to meet uh, their son, and uh, so grateful for PJ's presence in my life. And then finally, uh, there's a local guy. His name is Jay Jenin. Jay Jenin is the lead pastor at Chapel Valley uh, Four Square Church. It's in Fitchburg, Wisconsin, and I'm just so grateful for Jay Jenin and his presence in my life. He's side by side with me. We're doing ministry together. We're two lead pastors in this area, part of Foursquare, loving one another, loving the community. Thank you, Jay, for being side by side with me. Who's side by side with you? Who's, who's running at your pace? Who's got your passion? Who's going to go with you? Because ministry is personal. And then finally, who's your protege? Now, I got a couple people locally, and, you know, I, I could say as the lead pastor, really everybody at the journey, like you're, I'm called to equip you as saints to do the work of the ministry, but when I look at uh, who's my protege here at the journey, uh, some people came to mind, Nicole Myers, she's in the pastoral licensing process for Foursquare, she's an incredible woman of God, you've been blessed by her teaching, she's teaching at the women's event coming up on November 21st, I'm so grateful for Nicole, and so proud of her, and honored to have her as, as one of the people I'm discipling and pouring into because she's going far and she's going to do incredible things for God's kingdom. Other people that are protégés, a brand new couple, Chris and Kay Jenin. I'm so grateful for them, this young couple. And they moved out here. They love the mission and vision of the journey. They love the city of Madison. They left their church in Prairie du Chien. They got a word from the Lord. They moved to Madison. They got that now, now they're living here, they're doing ministry. You've been blessed by Chris and Kay as they give daily words, as Chris leads worship, and you're gonna continue to be blessed by them. And I'm so grateful that I get the opportunity to pour into Chris and Kay, Jen, and I think of uh, my boys, PJ, CJ, and AJ. Uh, they're they're protégés, right? I'm discipling PJ, CJ, and AJ. I want them to grow up to be men. Every night I pray for them. I pray that they would love their wives. I pray they would love their children. I pray that they would grow to be men who do great things for God's kingdom. I pray they be men who reject passivity, who accept responsibility, who lead courageously and invest eternally. Who are you pouring into? Who are you pouring into? Ministry is personal. Paul knew these people. Who's your mentor? Who's side by side with you and who's your protege? Next up, ministry is practical. Ministry is practical. See, Christianity is always practical. It's never just an intellectual exercise. It's always practical. Never just an intellectual exercise. It's not just a teaching ministry. Uh, we do need to be taught things. That's, you know, when you look at the book of Romans, Romans is a lot of theology. It's, it's 15 chapters of of theology, and yet it's not just about what we know. But I want to talk in this point about how practical ministry is about three things, the head, the heart, and the hands. Ministry is practical. It impacts what you know, who you are in your heart, and then what you do. Ministry is incredibly practical, the head, the heart, and the hands. The head, we need to be taught things. You need to learn. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to read other commentaries. You've got to have books that your reading or or do audio books or read but you've got to have a steady flow of things going in otherwise very few things are going to flow out of you of any encouragement because you're not you don't have things flowing into you we need to be taught things what do you know what do you need to know and what are you learning right now think about that what do you know 
How did you learn those things? Right now in your life, what do you need to know? What are the things you need to grow in and learn? And, and how can you grow? Uh, and then what are you learning right now? What are you learning right now? Heart. Heart is we're becoming more like Jesus. Head is, head is I have the mind of Christ. I understand the mind of Christ. Heart is I'm becoming more like Jesus. And, and here's some questions on heart. How did you get here? Where do you need to grow? And what is the bleeding edge of your growth? We, we are always, every day, growing to become more like Jesus. And these are some questions I ask myself. I remember as a, uh, as a young college student uh, being discipled by some great men and women in my life. And I started reading a book called The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And in that book, there's a chapter where A.W. Tozer talks about rending the veil. And he talks about how when we come to Jesus, when we repent of our sins and trust in Jesus as our Savior and Lord, when he, he gives us a new heart. And, and Tozer talks about this process of, of growing every day, of, of shedding the dead flesh of our old life and walking in the Spirit and in greater newness of the new life. And he calls it rending the veil, like we're passing from one plane of existence into another, where, where, where we are actually bringing the kingdom into our life. But, but the process is always painful because that dead flesh is still on us. And he talks about rending the veil, that we need to ask the great physician. We need to ask God that he would cut off those old pieces of dead flesh, our old life so that it can heal up and that we can grow to be who God's called us to be. And that process is never fun. It's never easy. That means we've got to look at something that's attached to us and say, this is hurting me. This dead flesh is going to infect the rest of me. And I've got to cut it off. Rending the veil. And it's always stuck out to me. And it reminds me that there's a bleeding edge of my life, meaning the bleeding edge of, of my growth in Christ is that edge. It's that point where God has come in and said, this dead flesh has got to be cut off now. You've got to grow here. And he cuts it off. And then, man, it's, it's fresh. And then he's going to cover that wound and he's going to heal it. What's the bleeding edge of your walk with Jesus? And if you don't have it, run to God and begin to grow today. Because God wants to see you experience greater and greater joy and that joy is going to come from as you leave the old life and put on the new life in Jesus and then finally hands we are the hands and feet of Jesus what have you done what things are you doing for the kingdom of God how are you ministering for the kingdom of God participating in laundry love buying presents for law new love Christmas um, serving in your community did, did you go to the polls and actually were you a poll uh, were, were you um, helping people vote at this uh, election that just happened? What is it that you're doing to serve and love the community to care for people? What, what have you done? What are you doing? And then what do you need to be doing? Think about where you want to go. What has God called you to do? What's the calling on your life to minister? When you look at Romans chapter 16, over and over again here, Paul is saying, look at these people ministering. Look at the ways that they are ministering. Head, heart, and hands, what they know, where their hearts are, what they're doing. Ministry is always practical. And it moves from, from being who I am in Christ to doing. And there's this cycle of like, I start with be who I am. I start as a Christian from rest. I start as a Christian from rest. One of the things I learned uh, a couple years ago is that, you know, God is the creator of the weekend, that he created the Sabbath. Why did he do that? He created the Sabbath so that we would rest, and out of rest, we would work. God creates us to rest and then work. Work for six days, rest, and then work again. But we don't, we don't, um, we, we want to work and rest. We want to be in Christ and do things for Christ. So, but always start with being and then go to doing. And then finally, I want to close with this. 
ministry is done in community. So we talked about ministry is personal, ministry is practical. Now ministry is done in community. We're always better together, together as a family, church community, and a larger community of faith. I'm filming here from Gateway Community Church. Why? Because there's a larger community of faith. And Pastor Paul and, and Mike and Patty and Justina and these incredible people here at Gateway opening their building to us, the Journey Community Church, or Journey Church, that, that we could minister in our community. I'm so grateful for the church's high point, for Ridgeway, for Lighthouse, for just the incredible churches that are part of the MP3 network. We need one another. Ministries done in community, Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Love one another. He says, greet the whole family. All the saints who are with them, greet one another. Community is both large and small. It's both our journey to community groups, it's in the homes, and it's larger gatherings like we're going to start doing here at Gateway Community Church. And eventually we'll be back at Goodman Center once there's a vaccine, once things have changed. You know we're going to be back. We're going to have great large gatherings and baptisms. It's going to be incredible. But right now we're enjoying a lot of small gatherings. And that still is a meeting of people where they're at. That's community. Community is both online and, and, and in person. Now, I know that online can never replace in person, and in person is different than online. There's strengths and weaknesses to both, but God is never limited by what we're doing, either online or in person. God is only limited by us being willing to actually be empowered by the Spirit and move God's mission forward, to come alongside what God is doing. Community is both deep and shallow. So communities, both small and large, communities online and in person, communities both deep and shallow. The gospel is easy enough for a child to understand, but deep enough for us to spend an eternity understanding. It's kind of like, um, the gospel is kind of like when you go to uh, the ocean. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to the ocean. I'm from Washington State, and so we got the ocean right there. Uh, but you can go to Lake Michigan or, or Lake Superior equally as, well, they're not equally as large, but they're very large. You can't see the other side of them. So you can say you've been to Lake Michigan, just by putting your feet in, that's like saying, I, I've heard the gospel, I've responded to it, and I love Jesus. But there, is, there are depths to Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, that you're going to need training. You're going to need to grow in order to get to the middle of that lake and then put a suit on to actually dive deep into the gospel. And if you want to grow, you've got to see the gospel as more than just waiting in the shallows, but actually moving into, get a boat, get some people with you, get some gear, and Go deep into the gospel. Community is both deep and shallow. And if you just came to Jesus, enjoy the shallow end. But if you've been with Jesus a long time, quit hanging out in the shallow end and go to the deep end. Dive deep into the gospel. Community is what we were made for. And I did some research on this, on the one another's. How many one another's there are in scripture. Jesus has commanded us to practice the one another's. The phrase one another is used a hundred times, 94 times in the New Testament. It's used 100 times in the Bible, 94 times in the New Testament. 47 of them are commands to followers of Jesus. Paul wrote 60% of the other commands. And Paul wrote this book of Romans. And, and he wrote 60% of the one another commands. Four of them are about kissing or affection towards one another in a physical sense. Which we see here in Romans chapter 16. They actually greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet like... Be close to one another. And I know right now with, we're not hugging one another. We're wearing masks. We're, we're being careful. We got to do that. But isn't there something missing that we can't hug one another, that we're not close to one another? It's because God made us for that closeness. And we're just praying for the end of this pandemic so we can be back to be close to one another. One third deal with getting along in church. Ain't that the truth? I mean, the church community is not about having peace all the time, but it's about making peace with one another. <laughs> In, in the church community, uh, we need these one another's to get along. One another, there's one third of one another's deal with commands for Christians to love one another. Not only get along in the church, but love one another. Commands to, to one another. 15% of the commands to love one another are about humility. Commanding humility and deference among believers. And the rest are don't judge one another, greet one another, bear, with one, bear one another's burdens, speak to one another in love, don't lie to each other, comfort one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, be hospitable to one another, teach and admonish one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs out of Colossians 3.16. And then finally, all the churches in Christ greet you.
you are connected. You are connected to, through the journey, to a movement of churches that's 90,000 strong worldwide. You're watching this sermon from Gateway Community Church. We're connected to Gateway. You are connected not just to the journey and, and the community we have here, but you're connected to churches throughout history and churches around the world. All the churches of Christ greet you. Now, in this day, when Paul was writing this, he knew all the churches in Christ. We, don't, we, we can't know every church in Christ right now because now it's worldwide. Now there's billions of people who love Jesus. But we got to remember that we are connected to a community of believers. When we're struggling to see God work in our own city, we have to recognize that there's people struggling that God would work in their city. The journey exists to lead people in the city to be transformed by the power and presence of Jesus. And we want to see people and our city. That means individuals and our city transformed by the power and the presence of Jesus. How do we do that? We gather in homes and in the city. We grow together in homes and throughout the city. And we go into our city to love and serve. And soon we'll go into the world. Right now it's a little... We're not, right now, we can go minister in our city. It's a little hard to go worldwide because, well, the global pandemic, but it's not always going to be that way. So what do we do? We gather, we grow together, and we go together. We gather together in both large and small groups. We, we grow together in large and small groups, and then, and then we go. We go and we minister and we love because ministry is personal. Ministry is practical. Ministry is done in community. I just encourage you. If you don't know Jesus, if you're watching this and you're thinking, man, this sounds incredible. I want, I want to have that personal relationship with other people. I want, to have pract- I want to have a mission and a vision. I want to have a community. You repent of your sins. You trust in Jesus. Romans 10, 17. And confess with your mouth that, be- that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That Jesus died on the cross in your place for your sin and rose again on the third day. Defeated your greatest enemies of Satan, sin and death. So put your faith in him and trust in Jesus today. Christian, who's your mentor? Who are you running side by side with? Who are you discipling? What do you know? What do you need to know? Christian, where's your heart? What's the bleeding edge of your walk with Jesus? Christian, what what, what do you need to be doing? We got Laundry Love Christmas coming up. I pray we we support Laundry Love Christmas. I pray we we support um, the the Goodman Community Center and the food baskets. And then we're looking for ways, not just what we deliver here from the pulpit, but we're looking for ways to serve our community and go. And then finally, community. Look at these one another's. Serve one another. Love one another. Care for one another. And fulfill the law of Christ. Greet one another. Because all the churches in Christ greet you today love you, church. In the words of one of my mentors, Bert Smith, you are greater in the eyes of the Lord than you are on your own. I love you. I'm so grateful that you joined us today. I'm going to pray to close our service, and then let's, let's go. We've gathered together. We've grown together. Now let's go into our community to love and serve for the glory of God and the joy of all peoples. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to look at your word to see clearly how we can grow, to see clearly how, how uh, we can go into our city. And God, thank you for the opportunity to gather, to gather online, to gather in person, to gather in small and large groups, uh, empowered by your Holy Spirit. God, I pray blessing over the church. I pray health over the church. We pray an end to the pandemic. We pray, God, uh, peace in our country. We pray for the moving forward of the kingdom of God and the gospel in our city. In your name, Jesus, amen. Love you, church.